organizations. Uh, way you do that online here is enter that in the chat box. So if you don't mind taking a few minutes to just let us know your name and organization, that would be helpful. I'm Grant Tate, and I'm from uh, Bridgewater Business Transformations and the uh, chair of the group and co-chair of the group, along with Dick Abbott, who's not on the link today so far. Can everybody find the chat group? So in addition to that, let's take a minute and uh, just go around and tell us verbally who you are and uh, where you're connecting from and so forth. So Letty, I can see you. Why don't you start? Can you hear me? You know, it's loud and clear. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. so, hi, everybody. I'm just sort of sitting on the sideline. I'm the new Defense Affairs Committee Program Manager for the Chamber. And I think over time, um, both the policy committee and our committee will be working together on some initiatives. So I'm just sitting in and I want to learn about, you know, the whole um, Wi-Fi issue that we have going on in the community. Right, right. Thank you. Next. Neil, I can see you. <coughs> Neil Williamson with the Free Enterprise Forum. Uh, the Free Enterprise Forum is a privately funded public policy organization. The Chamber is one of our founding partners, and I have been following and working with Mike Culp for, well, it seems like forever, Mike, Michael, but you know, it, uh, it has been some time. Um, the uh, Broadband Authority has been moving forward in different uh, speeds throughout since its founding, and I'm really looking forward to the presentation. And Kara? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Kara Shandison. I'm the city manager for Ting Charlottesville. Um, for those of you that don't know what Ting is, Ting is a fiber optic um, internet service here in Charlottesville. And we also serve 11 towns from the Atlantic mm -hmm. to the Pacific. So growing. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Kirby. Hi, I'm Kirby Hutto, a chamber board member, also general manager of the Sprint Pavilion. Um, I have suffered with CenturyLink attempting to provide broadband at my house for years. Mike actually helped me out on that when I was having some serious <laughs> problems. And I cannot wait for uh, Central Virginia Electric Co-op to get Firefly to me next year. Fantastic. Esther. I'm just getting off of mute. Um, hi, I'm Esther Bobbin. Um, I have a tech startup. Um, also working on changing it into a nonprofit called United by Chocolate. Um, we're working on machine learning translation. Um, but what piqued my interest with joining this is actually from the side of being a parent um, in virtual learning and um, interested to see if there's any work going on on um, having like Wi-Fi spots or hot spots around town and at parks and um, public spaces. Good, thank you. Brian. Good afternoon, Brian Thomas uh, at First Citizens Bank, Commercial Bank, and here, a past chair and board member of the Chamber of Commerce. Good, thank you. Jeff? Uh, Jeff Nelson, Draper Aiden Associates. We are an engineering company that does a lot of work with infrastructure, and actually uh, our, our local office works uh, with King a good bit for some of the survey locating for them. Great, thank you. Uh, Charles. Charles Hartgrove, I'm with the Virginia Institute of Government, which is part of a Weldon Cooper Center for Public Service. And one of our initiatives <laughs> is helping cities, towns, and counties uh, become digital communities. So we're very excited to hear what we talk about today. Fantastic. Valerie. Hi, I'm Valerie Long. I am a real estate and land use and zoning attorney at Williams Mullen. And I practice a lot in the wireless area. So I'm particularly interested in this. And I'm a former uh, chair of the board for the chamber from several years ago, and also on the board of the Free Enterprise Forum with Neil. Thanks. Thank you. Don? John Long. I'm an attorney with 
uh, Flora Pettit and a member of the Public Policy Committee and also Valerie's husband. Great, thank you. Chris. Hi, Chris Engel, City of Charlottesville, Office of Economic Development and member of the Policy Committee. Thanks. No, Missy, Misty. Hi there, good afternoon. I'm Misty Parsons. I'm with the UVA Foundation and the UVA Research Park. And I do uh, marketing and relationships management here. And so I'm just uh, curious to sit in and listen. Thank you. And Lisa. Hi, um, I'm Lisa Hernan. I'm a part of the board as Lisa Hernan. And I'm, forgive my background, it keeps messing up. But um, <laughs> I'm on, I'm on uh, the meeting today. Very good. Thank you. Uh, did I miss anybody? I'm just calling based on the pictures I can see. <laughs> okay. And what about Elizabeth? Well, okay. Elizabeth, are you going to say something? <laughs> sure. I think that takes us to our next uh, item on the agenda. So I wanted right. to, um, to wel welcome everyone. Um, we are really uh, excited to have you all here today. And one of the things that came up over and over and over again in our Project Rebound uh, committee meetings and groups was there was one overarching issue that everybody cared about and it was broadband. Um, and it was both an urgent and pressing need in times of COVID, um, but also is a sort of longer term goal for um, economic growth and um, access to more people. So um, when I talked to a couple of folks about wanting to discuss this with our public policy team and starting to maybe have a couple of action items or framing up the conversation a bit, um, <clears throat> Mike Culp's name kept coming up over and over again. I think Neil, you were the first person who said, well, you should talk to Mike, but it, it came up on more than one occasion. And so I'm, I'm especially glad that you're able to um, join us today. Um, I'm also glad that Kara is here from Ting. I'm glad you're all here, but Kara also um, is working pretty deeply in this area. Maybe she can chime in a little bit after the presentation. Um, but Grant, I'll turn it back over to you to introduce our speaker. Okay, well, uh, Mike, uh, the interesting thing to me is I had not worked with Mike, but Every source I talked to said, well, you've got to talk to Mike Culp, from, uh, who's uh, Director of Information Technology in Albemarle. So uh, really looking forward to this and uh, just also to amplify what uh, Elizabeth just said. I spent five years in Europe. And uh, if you want to irritate me, uh, one of the things you can say is the United States has the most advanced telecommunication system in the world. Well, uh, not if measured by the number of people who have access in terms of percentage of the population. So um, I've been in uh, uh, countries from uh, Western to Eastern Europe uh, and in some countries, for instance, the Eastern Europe, they actually skipped over plain old telephone system, went straight to cellular and you can go anywhere in the country at uh, even 20 years ago and be connected. So anyway, uh, Mike, uh, from all, all I've uh, heard about his work, has uh, been advancing the cause here in Albemarle County and the region. And Mike, we're eager to hear from you. Well, thanks, Grant. Thanks, everybody, for taking time out. I see a lot of familiar faces, and I'm honored to be here. So I hope that uh, I've got some good updates and then more importantly, some great conversation with everyone to sort of keep the ball rolling. There's a lot of activity that's going on right now, some of which we can discuss, some of which is still underway, um, but we'll get to that at the end of my five slides. So I'm gonna share my screen and um, please, if you have questions, go ahead and, and jump in when, when that happens. And I'm glad to, glad to stop at any time and take questions and answer them, I hope, or if not, I'll get with the right people and be able to make sure we can do that. So let me know when you can see my PowerPoint and then I'll switch it to full screen. So does everybody see it so far? Oh yes, so good. Okay, 
All right, so I'm going to move to uh, presentation mode. Hopefully that helps you view the, view the slide. So um, over here on the right, there's a, a broadband survey, which is now bilingual. So it's got a Spanish language version. Um, this is available 100% of the time, 24 seven. It's been active going on for, gosh, I think at least uh, since 13 or 14, we started our first efforts at, at broadband surveying. So it's been a while um, since our first survey and we're very proud that we feel we as a locality, um, including the Albemarle County Public Schools, are doing the best job of getting the word out and getting people to fill out these surveys. We have a lot of um, interesting data. We could take the whole hour just talking about the analytics that go into look at, looking at that data, but I just wanted to point that out as, as, a, as a start for this. Um, the other thing that's important on the slide, if you go to our new website, Albemarle, dot org slash broadband, you'll see the broadband authorities page. And from that page, there's a, a way to get to the survey. Um, so we, we always encourage people to uh, report on their issues using the broadband survey um, because it gives us some, some automatic speed test data. We're actually collecting speed test data as part of the survey now, and that's part of our analytics. So it's a, a good, great tool for us to go through and look at data after the fact or when you're calling and saying, hey, I'm having problems with my provider. Um, so I wanted to go, go back a little bit. I think it's important for us to all realize, I think Neil mentioned this early on, um, Kirby as well, that this has been going on for a really long time. Uh, David Blunt uh, was probably the first person who really got me rolling on this and then Dwayne Snow um, some people remember Dwayne. I mean, he's still here, but <laughs> you know what I mean? He's, he definitely got this going within the Board of Supervisors. Um, but way back in 2019, there was the American Recovery and, and Resistance Act or something like that. Um, and it was, it, it, there was an opportunity that TGA PDC led. Uh, we had a company actually come in and, and propose with us, but we, we weren't able to uh, pull in funds in 2019. Dwayne then came in and said, hey, we need a task force. We started a task force and there was some effort uh, with the University of Virginia um, to join GIGU and the University of Virginia joined um, GIG.U and there was, some, there was some good stuff going on there, but it sort of fell short. And then we put together a huge uh, effort, a community effort to see if we could uh, make Charlottesville one of the Google cities. Um, some of us remember the Google Fiber days. Um, that also, we were not selected. I think Kansas City was one of the cities that got selected, maybe a few others. Um, so after that, we sort of went to the fact that what was the reason why we weren't awarded any money during the ARA days, during the Rust days, Rural Utility Services? And it was because we didn't have a good plan. We didn't have a good broadband plan. So we worked with the state and in 2015, the Commonwealth of Virginia through the Virginia uh, Telecommunication Planning in Initiative. So there's two initiatives that the state put together. One was the planning initiative. Uh, and we were one of the counties that received a 75,000 broadband planning grant. Um, that formed a, a pretty big team. We had a lot of people on a number of task forces and uh, we were successful in getting a, a plan put together. And that plan was accepted by the Board of Supervisors in 2016. Um, at the same time, we were also working um, to make sure that Connect America funding um, was provided to Albemarle County. Um, and as such, um, the Connect America funding back in 2016 brought a number of our areas up from no DSL at all to three to 10 megs. So if you go way back to 2016, uh, people who were receiving three meg uh, at that point through Connect America funding um, were very happy. Uh, <laughs> since that time, three meg is not, not getting you what you need from a telecommuting and all the other things that are important in today's uh, normal society. We're definitely not normal when we don't have broadband speeds. So I think everybody agrees with that, and I won't go into the nasty details about what it means not to have it. So then the Commonwealth decided in 2017 to create a, 
an initiative that actually supports public-private public partnerships. Um, so we've been uh, involved with the Virginia Telecommunication Initiative, which is called BODY, um, different than the planning initiative. This is actual funding that goes to localities and their partners um, to provide broadband services to rural areas. Um, in 2017, the minimum speeds were 10-1. So for, for an area to qualify for body in 2017, the speeds had to be um, less than 10-1. The county decided at that point to focus on specific areas that were smaller in general. Um, so we were fortunate in 2017 to be awarded $118,000 from the state um, to do 284 locations. And that was with CenturyLink and that brought people who had no service at all. So these were people who didn't have the option for DSL that we brought up to, to have DSL for the first time. So 10 meg and above um, for 284 locations. At the same time, the broadband authority was formed. Uh, one of the recommendations from the plan was that the broadband authority be formed as, an, as a political entity of the board of supervisors. So. When you think about the broadband authority, we are a political entity that was provided through the Board of Supervisors. One important thing to remember about the broadband authority is that the only way that we could be formed was through what's called the Wireless Services Authority Act. Um, that's a Commonwealth of Virginia Act that has certain stipulations about how a broadband authority acts and it's not specific to wireless. It also provides for doing things like fiber and hybrid coax. So we're, we're formed, we're formed not to own or operate a network. Uh, the broadband authority is interested in partnering only. Um, one of the big advantage with the broadband authority is that it receives appropriations from the board of supervisors, but that money is put toward initiatives that include private entities. So as we went through, it made it easier for us to do future applications with body. We so didn't have as many to, stipulations. Yeah, go ahead. Just a minute. When you say locations, is a location a home or business? Home or business, yes. Farm, yes, so, home, okay. business, yeah. So uh, it's public, not, it's public not entity a- Public entity too. Parks and rec and schools and all that. Yes, okay. yes sir. All right. Yep, all right. thanks for that clarity. Um, so, the 2017, we partnered with CenturyLink. 2018, we had a bigger project uh, submitted with us in Comcast. Um, that was submitted prior to the actual incorporation of the broadband authority. So 2018, when you look at it officially, it was with the county and Comcast. So that was, a, that was our biggest project to date funding wise, but it was the first time we moved away from DSL into a hybrid coax um, environment. Um, since that time, we have, con we have continued on that, that role. Um, we will never go back to DSL. Uh, there's, no, there's not going to be any more federal, well, any more state funds and no more local funds that go to upgrading any type of DSL connection. So that we can clearly say. Uh, 2019, and this is the one that, uh, well, part of one that, that Kirby had mentioned, we had a really successful application with CBEC and Firefly. They did our Midway substation, which is now providing services for, well, not all 341, but they did really well. They had like a 73% take rate. So out of that 341, they're out of their membership, the highest of all of the substations. I, I think I'll get two in the weeds on this, but um, CVEC, when they decided to move to providing fiber, they had to create a subsidiary, and that subsidiary is Firefly. Um, what they're doing is for each of their electrical <clears throat> substations, they're creating projects that go through each of their substations. The one that we're um, successful with the body money is called Midway, and Midway um, gave us the opportunity to provide service to up to 344. 41 locations in Albemarle. So that was a really good project. Uh, lots of people have benefited from that. And uh, we're really excited for the future of where CVIC and Firefly are going in the rural areas. Um, next slide, I'm heading toward the next slide. All right, so this is probably where everybody wants me to spend most of my time. 
Um, and I, I'm glad to take a lot of questions about these uh, three points here. Um, the first one is the one that I'm actively managing, and that is the 2020 Fiber to the Home project with CenturyLink. Um, we're doing frequently asked questions. We're hosting call-ins where people could call in and ask questions. It's a big project with $291,000 of support from the Commonwealth. Um, I probably should have clarified on this. When I talk about VADI, uh, VADI is a program that is run by the Department of Housing and Community Development in Richmond. So it's a Commonwealth of Virginia based program uh, with funds allocated by the General Assembly and then DHCD manages the project, the program every year. Um, so this particular one, we were offered funds and uh, CenturyLink and, and the Broadband Authority are working to get this project done by March 15th. Um, there's eight distinct areas that are all being offered fiber to the premise or fiber to the home. Um, so we're, we're actively and very excited about moving this project forward. Um, so that brings me to 2021, which is the latest application that went in August 17th. And this is our biggest yet, obviously, and where we're, we're hoping for support is, um, you know, the notice of award may be 2020, end of 2020, start of 2021, but a lot depends on whether special session um, goes through and adds additional funding to VADI. Right now, the budget for VADI is 19 million. There are 53 applications this year um, asking for way, way above that amount. Um, there's hopes that there's going to be additional budget provided during the special session, up to 48 million instead. And even with that, my guess is only like 20 of those applications, probably less, will be offered funds. So just to you know put put that into perspective, it's a it's a very small likelihood of award this year. Um, if the 48 million is added, it, it raises that up a little bit, but not as much. I mean, this is a pretty significant amount of money we're requesting this year. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons why we're, we're requesting this much is because they've moved from a minimum of 10 to a minimum of 25. So just to show you where the state is headed, um, we're going forward with projects that would bring 25 meg as a download speed. So to give you that as a perspective, we're looking at 25 meg as the delivery speed, but CenturyLink is going all fiber. So everything to the home would be nine, 938 megabits per second down. Um, so that's, that's where we're at it with this big one. Um, it's an extension. We, we view it as an, as an extension of the active project with CenturyLink. Um, if we're rewarded, it, it makes sense because we're just going to continue to, to build the CenturyLink infrastructure. Just to let you know that, you know, while this is all going on, we're also working directly with CVIC Firefly because we have a tax grant incentive with them. So as they go forward and build out the other substations in Albemarle, um, we have the, uh, an agreement with them that gives them incentives to complete their work quickly. So we're working in that, that direction. Um, as far as the future goes, sorry, let me go back a slide. Um, as far as the future goes, uh, there's a lot going on with the CARES Act. Um, we've got uh, numerous uh, initiatives going on, um, some of which I can talk about, uh, others that are still sort of ongoing. Hopefully we'll, we'll have more information as, as September moves on. I think someone mentioned about Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, our partnerships with the schools have provided Wi-Fi hotspots for the public at every single uh, Albemarle County School. Um, we're also working on a project to put up Wi-Fi hotspots at the Greenwood Community Center. Um, we've got some ideas about using some of our parks to do the same type of thing, but our goal is to, to provide as much free public Wi-Fi as possible. Um, some of that will be done through the CARES Act. Some of that's already happening with the school, so that's a, a real positive thing. The other thing that we're working toward, and this is another school um, initiative, is uh, digital equity. 
making sure that everything that we provide is affordable um, and we sort of bridge that digital equity gap. Uh, so that's that's one of the other goals that we have that's put forward as a broadband authority. Um, eventually, what we're hoping to do is build redundant fiber rings throughout the region. So we're hopeful that working with TJPDC um, will kind of come together and build a plan that's more regional um, so that when a cut happens, and this happens in Southern Albemarle quite a bit, um, people aren't off grid forever or for days. Um, so we're working to kind of build out a redundant fiber ring for the region or rings essentially. And I mentioned before, our continued work with CBIC Firefly. We're just going forward and working as hard as we can to make sure that they're able to finish the work on the Albemarle substations. And what we're looking for is additional partnerships. So this is one of the reasons that I'm glad to talk with everybody today and hopefully come up with some ideas and some ongoing plans to continue to build partnerships so that we get the best uh, for Albemarle County and, and its residents. So I just want to summarize and say, you know, we're, we're very fortunate that we've had four years of success with VADI. Uh, that's the Virginia Telecommunication Initiative. Um, using that, that, that broadband opportunity, um, we've, we've gone past 803 locations so far. And with the, the one that's ongoing now with CenturyLink, the Fiber to the Home project, um, there's 837 more uh, that will soon be offered broadband fiber. Um, we've got that recent application. So anything that, that, that all of us can do to influence the General Assembly passing the updated budget in special session will be important for that. Um, so just point, pointing out that that's a, a nice thing that could happen with this. Um, all of the employers like the University of Virginia and Centera, Martha Jefferson, probably have people who want to telecommute who live in Albemarle or having difficulty with doing all the distance learning that's a requirement now. Um, we've got to get better and working to better together. Um, and maybe there's a way to work with major employers to see if there's funding available to offset some of the money that we're going to need to do some of these big projects. Um, that's one of the ways to do that is letters of support from the rural businesses. Now they can go to the Board of Supervisors or to the General Assembly, um, but I'm also, you know, I'm willing and able to, to pull all those letters together. And I have a lot of them that were submitted in the last body application, but it never hurts to stop collecting. Um, so something like that would be beneficial too. Uh, and that ends my uh, presentation with a request for additional partnerships and support with letters and however else you guys think you can help us move forward the effort to bring broadband to all of the rural residents. So oh, thank thanks. you, thank, thanks so much, uh, Mike. And I'd just like to mention to everyone that we are recording this session. So as you ask uh, questions and get answers, I uh, just wanted you to be aware of that. So Mike, thank you so much. Um, I guess sort of to start things off, uh, I was wondering if, uh, if rural businesses, you know, for instance, a uh, business located in a uh, fairly remote part of the county, uh, we could encourage them to offer uh, free Wi-Fi uh, as part of their network for people that are in the parking lot, for instance? Yeah, I'll take that question. It's a, um, a big question about what's typically referred to as backhaul. Mm -hmm. um, so it's great if you're in a rural area and you have either hybrid coax or fiber connection to your business, then one of the opportunities that I think is available there is to you know, put external Wi-Fi type devices out near the parking lot so people can, can gain access that way. But it goes back to you have to have that initial connectivity before you can start allowing um, right. free public Wi-Fi because you don't want to overload your point of sale. Uh, a lot of the rural businesses are using point of sale out there and you know, to, to do anything more with that limited connectivity um, might might restrict them from actually uh, processing sales and credit card uh, 
credit card application. So yeah, that's, that's how I would start the answer to that question. And uh, Neil has asked, why not have government buildings provide such access? Yeah, the government, that's a good question, Neil. Um, you know, our rural areas, uh, the schools are connected, right? So that you've got free public Wi-Fi at each of the, the schools. Um, we're trying to work within the public safety um, realm, meaning, you know, there's a lot of fire rescue stations. Um, they're volunteer in general. The, the big challenge with volunteers, there's two big challenge challenges. While they may be connected to high speed, they're it's a little bit of a concern to have people driving up in those particular parking lots because there's activity, you know, whether it's a fire truck or a rescue mm -hmm. squad or somebody having to leave. Um, so that's, that's one of the challenges there. The parks, we have been trying, I have to admit, and maybe some, some folks know about some of these efforts to, to activate the parks, but once again, there's no backhaul. Um, they don't have the ability, um, we have a tough time just getting our employees and the parks to connect up and use our network resources here at the county uh, because we don't have enough backhaul or you know enough connectivity to the parks themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the other big question. We'd like to do that. Um, the advantage, one of the areas, Greenwood Community Center, is what I mentioned earlier. We see a huge opportunity there, and we're working toward activating that as a public Wi-Fi hotspot this mm -hmm. fall. Okay. Okay, and Letty has asked, what percentage of the county does not have any reliable connectivity? And where are those clusters? Yeah, that's a great question, yeah. Letty. Um, we have a, 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 in the application itself, and there's a, I think I'll take this and send it out to the group. Um, and it's definitely something that you can keep an eye on. We have an arc, what's called an ArcGIS map that puts together those areas, the areas that we're tracking for broadband projects. Um, so I'll, I'll link that up to the broadband authority site sometime in the next week. Um, so that'll be a way that you can go and track. And the, the other answer to that question, this question comes up a lot. It really depends um, <laughs> because there's a lot of things that are happening, meaning there's activations that are happening at all times. That's the positive side. The negative side is that there, there are months that um, things start going bad. Like right now, there's a lot of big issues out there, even with the people who have been off for 10, some, in some cases, places where people have been off for 25, they're seeing uh, degradation of service and it's based on the number of people who have been accessing the service. So um, I hate to not be able to give you a direct answer, mm -hmm. but it depends. But I would, I would generally say, um, the areas that are most impacted are 100% rural. Um, so we don't see as many problems in the urban ring. A lot of that is, you know, you've got Ting and others doing a great job of providing services there. The development areas seem to be pretty good. But as soon as you get right outside, like there's, a, there's an area right outside Crozet called Lane Town Road, and they can't even get three meg. So it's right, you know, they're thinking they're right on the border of Crozet. Why am I not getting anything other than three meg and it's just the, the infrastructure is not there. So it's, it's sort of all around us and it varies based on degradation of service. There's another concern that some of the equipment um, is, is out of date and can no longer provide the service it was originally intended to do. So all of that equipment needs to be upgraded. And uh, that's why it's uh, the good thing about the body stuff is it, it moving up to 25.3 does a great thing for everybody, um, but we have to have additional funding coming from somewhere. Um, hopefully the, the, the budget amendment that brings body up to 48 mil is, it will be a good thing for us, 48 million. Okay. How will, uh, how will 5G attract, uh, change your strategy? Let's see, <laughs> wow, that's a good question. Uh, 5G is, is out there. I know that a lot of people have heard uh, the hype, uh, and it's a positive thing. There's a lot of good things happening with it. Um, it requires a, 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 a significant amount of distribution, meaning additional poles, whether they're small cell type poles or larger uh, type environments. 
questions about 5G really need to go through our zoning department. Um, I think that's the, the best way to start. You know, Bar Savada and Bill Fritz um, can take questions about where the wireless environment is headed for us. Um, so I'm not trying to divert on that question. I think yeah. there's some, some positive things that are coming. Um, it's just a, a better question for the zoning department. Yeah. Yeah, okay, all right. And then, uh, if I could, on, on one thing, um, Jeff Nelson just posted a question that makes my heart sing. <laughs> <laughs> I, what I'm really hoping to accomplish with this uh, sort of newly formatted public policy committee, and I thank the, the steering committee members who are sort of helping me get that together with our chair and co-chair, is I'm hoping that we can find um, issues of shared interest that we can then bring to our board of directors to say, hey, we'd like to take a, a positive position on this <clears throat> and then do exactly what Jeff is, is suggesting is then going out to our chamber members and soliciting letters of support on mass um, in a really, uh, at the right time and at the right place. And so in addition to the question about you know, who do we address those letters to and stuff. I, I just want to recognize that going forward, this committee wants to encourage these kind of discussions and finding common themes that we can actually leverage the power of our convening uh, to advocate. So um, with that, I'll, I'll, Mike, you can go ahead and respond to the question itself. But thank you, Jeff, for bringing that up. Yeah. I Jeff, I agree with that. I think it's uh, everybody realizes how important um, this particular effort across the Commonwealth is. It's a uh, it's the new way of doing business. I don't think there's any doubt that business in general is positively impacted when the business has access to the same type of services, no matter where you are. And there's a significant disadvantage when you can't connect to the internet on a frequent and reliable basis. So it's, um, it's sort of one, of one of our nations as well as the Commonwealth's biggest in initiatives and biggest challenges uh, we need to solve. And working together is a way to do that. So I guess that was a question. Maybe I missed yeah. a question there, Grant. Did I miss it? <laughs> no, that's, that's uh, pretty, I think, uh, well, one of the things we'll, you can be thinking about is who else do we need to talk about? And we do have Kara from Ting here. So Kara, yeah. would you like to uh, step in here and give us a little overview from your point of view? Sure. Um, well, first of all, it's always great to have Mike mm. um, go through and talk about what's been happening within the county um, with the Broadband Association. So um, thank you, Mike. I always appreciate your information that you share. You know, for Ting, we are a newer company compared to some of our competitors. So unlike uh, Comcast or CenturyLink, that's been in the Charlottesville and the Albemarle, Albemarle area for quite some time with a really strong infrastructure, Ting has just celebrated our five-year anniversary. So I always like to explain it, we're the toddler in the kind of the broadband arena here in Albemarle. So we, you know, came to this area um, partnering and, and eventually buying Blue Ridge Internet Works. Um, and our concentration was to bring fiber optic services to the city of Charlottesville. Um, so the only product that we deliver is a complete fiber to the home product. So a gigabit product, which would be symmetrical speeds um, or a lower end product for, you know, still fiber to the home, but folks that maybe have just one or two people in their household, just doing some Google searches or email that really don't need to have the um, capacity that, you know, a family with kids working from home and schooling from home now need. Um, so we've spent the last five years working diligently with the city um, to build out the city. And this past year, we started moving more into the county location. So um, we do serve 100% of the Redfields location, but we've also pulled fiber up Rio Road. Um, we're serving Dunlora and Belvedere. Um, we're about to build Northfields and Raintree areas. And then we'll be moving up 29 towards UVA Research Park and bringing fiber to the larger development that are 
um, planking, you know, 29 all the way up 29 north. Um, so for us, it's although we are very much um, interested and do support as many initiatives as we can to make sure that internet is offered to people. It's very hard for a new company like us to um, develop true rural broadband plans. Um, and basically that's because of infrastructure um, not having you know, a lot of fiber in those locations to begin with. So we would be pulling fiber all the way from downtown Charlottesville, which is our data center, all the way out. Um, and then density issues are always a challenge. So you'll find with Ting, we're really trying to go to, you know, serving the city of Charlottesville, but then also working with larger neighborhoods where we can bring as much fiber as we can and serve as many people as we can. Um, you know, we've we've definitely looked at the CARES Act. Um, we would love to be involved with that. We did, you know, speak with the county about working with the county on the CARES Act, but some of the challenges with that would be, um, you know, building where there's no other provider, as well as lighting customers up by the end of the year. Um, so for folks that are familiar with engineering and permitting and buying fiber and then lighting customers, it's it's nowhere near a one quarter process, <laughs> one quarter calendar year process. That combined with COVID extended deliveries, as well as new processes that had to be um, you know, developed so our technicians aren't going into homes for installations has been you know, a challenging year. Um, when COVID happened, you know, the folks at Ting, we all thought, wow, we're going to be very, very busy with installations. But then quickly, 24 hours later, we thought we can't go into homes to bring the fiber into the homes because of COVID. So it's a blessing and a curse at the same time. Um, but, you know, with that said, we, we have done numerous things to help Charlottesville and the county during this time period. Um, we offer free internet at, y at Ix Park. So that's fed by our fiber optic network. Um, we have several access points that we've put up on poles at X Park. So people are getting the same symmetrical gigabit speeds there. Um, I've done actually some meetings there and I actually did an interview there where I was getting symmetrical speeds at the time. So um, that's, that's something that we will continue to keep up for the public to use, especially with children going back to school and doing virtual learning. Um, we've supported our, our local small businesses through monetary um, you know, gift cards, and we're continuing to support the community with virtual learning pods, um, you know, encouraging anyone that knows of organizations and groups that are starting virtual learning pods, we would love to provide the internet. Um, not released yet, but we are supporting the YMCA with that initiative with their virtual learning pod um, for this school year as well. So, you know, we're very much in support of doing as much as we can with the city and the county. It just is a little challenging for us to support those rural broadband efforts due to density and our current infrastructure is just not that far um, into the county yet. So it uh, sounds like bottom line that you're following the commercial high density areas as the first priority. Actually, our, our model is to, um, to follow residential. Um, mm -hmm. So within the city, as you can imagine, many of our small businesses and even you know, more mid-sized businesses we, we like to support within the city limits. Um, we are supporting businesses on pan tops as well as North 29. Um, you'll see us expanding into more businesses this year. Um, but in general, you know, we are trying to bring fiber to those really dense, larger developments right now um, and trying to work our way out from the city. While continuing to build in the city, we're doing what we're calling a parallel build. So it's continuing to work in the city and also providing service outside. Okay, good, thank you. Thank so you. other people jump in with questions as you like. Yeah, Mike, I've got a question um, relative to the scale of the remaining challenge for Albemarle. Um, you know, how many more locations have you all identified that need upgraded service? And is there a dollar range of what it's going to cost to get us there? Yeah, now that I'm unmuted. 
<laughs> yeah, great question. We're continuing. I'm going to try to answer it the best I can. At least a thousand, less than three thousand now. Um, and that you're going to look at that and say, well, that's a really r wide range. And I'm also going to give you a five to fifteen million dollar effort to get the rest of the county activated. Um, so that's a that's a really wide range. I think we're in better shape than most, um, meaning that we're building fiber through at least two initiatives right now. There's fiber going on with Civic Firefly. So that's going to, and obviously your location, Kirby, yep. um, is going to be one of the activated ones. So we consider that as, as one of the um, prime areas where we think we can continue to build. The other thing that, that needs to be mentioned is that there's also some initiative going on that will extend the Civic Firefly to non civic So just so that people are aware, that's another opportunity that we're working toward. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we're, you know, CVIC is, is concentrating on their membership only. But if you look at the footprint in Albemarle, there's a lot of places where um, uh, not a significant investment, but working with Dominion Power, Appalachian Power, and Rappahannock Power, uh, there may be some ways to extend their service. So that's another opportunity for us. Um, in addition to that, you've got the CenturyLink fiber project that's going on now. So that's going to significantly reduce our numbers over the, the next eight to 18 months. Um, so let's keep an eye on that. Hopefully we're going to be successful in reducing the numbers that I gave and don't quote me on any of those. I would love to be able to give you a consistent number. I think Letty, you asked me the same question and it comes to me all the time. It's very difficult to assess the actual need as things are, are changing frequently. Um, so keeping up with the changes as well as um, providing accurate numbers when sometimes systems fail, new systems come on board. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge, but thanks, thanks for asking the question, Curry. Hopefully I gave you a pretty decent answer. I know I wish I could do better. <laughs> Well, I mean, that, that doesn't yeah. sound as big as I was expecting, quite frankly. Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah, don't hold, it, don't hold me to it, but we're getting, we're getting there. Yeah, I still, oh, you know, uh, CenturyLink has to finish this big project. I mean, there's 830 some odd locations, and then CVEC is only, I would say, maybe at 50% through, with they have 3,400 members. So, you know, the, the numbers, it, it varies based on, where they are with each of their projects. So I'm giving the optimistic view, assuming that both CenturyLink and Civic Firefly are going to get the work done that they've started. Yeah. Uh, this is Chris Engel. This question for Mike and um, Kara, potentially. Um, just your comments about um, the cooperative nature or lack thereof amongst telecommunication providers. Um, you know, I hear stories from time to time about this company couldn't get to me because they couldn't get permission from X, Y, or Z. Um, and that seems to be preventing, you know, additional broadband connectivity across the city. And, and some of these stories are in the city, which is largely um, covered compared to the county. But is there anything particularly, this is a public policy committee, uh, we're talking about writing letters of support. Is there anything that could be included that would encourage our delegates, representatives, to um, tweak those rules uh, to allow a little bit more flexibility. I don't know enough of the details to know where, where those levers might be, but um, any comments on that? Sure, I'll take that, Chris. Um, for Ting working within the city, I think we've got two hurdles that, um, you know, we've done a great job and the city has done a great job talking to us and explaining um, why these are hurdles within the city. I think a large part is because, um, you know, we do live in a historical area and a historical town. So um, bringing fiber throughout some of the more historical areas uh, would lend towards a different deployment method that we would like to try. Um, but the city has been a little bit nervous about approving that. So um, the deployment issue and the deployment method would be one that I would love to further explore and have conversations about. Um, we've seen a lot of progress on the timing of permits come from the city with Ting. Um, but again, as always, the timeline of providing fiber and building fiber and lighting customers is just so very lengthy. <laughs> that if we could find ways to shorten that timing and shorten that process, that would benefit the end users and the people in the city. I'm 
like to comment. We have uh, just about a little less than 10 minutes left um, in the meeting. And I'd like to kind of pivot a little bit from all of this great information and just sort of think, and we don't have to have answers today, but you know, as we try to uh, work as a public policy committee to inform our board, to enable them to take positions and mobilize chamber membership, I would love for us to think about a couple of very concrete action items we can take, not just right now, like the writing letters of support, I, I think is a very concrete action item, but you know, this is an important issue and it's going to be for the next several years. And are there some things that we could map out as an organization that I could take to the board and say, here's what the chamber should be doing next year. You know, here, here's when we should be really uh, pushing hard on this issue. Here's who we should be talking to. I would love to see us as a committee kind of think about what that roadmap could be. Um, Grant, would you, would you agree with that? that that's no, totally. And one of the things I was thinking about, and uh, I think it was Misty brought up learning pods. And so if you think about, if you start with the customer and you look at a child who is now learning online for the first time uh, and parents who may not know how to use online capabilities or even uh, help with the learning process, then, and teachers have so much capacity to be able to deal with that. So it seems to me that uh, somehow across the community, I don't know if it's a chamber or maybe a nonprofit, but organized tutors who could work with the children by way of this medium or whatever the medium is with the schools and work with those learning pods and organize those learning pods. So if you think of, uh, here's first grade, for instance, and, uh, and we're talking about a particular subject that there are tutors who can engage with the children in that network and help them learn through, help them through the process. I think that's a really, a really an important effort. <clears throat> and uh, I haven't uh, mapped out any way to think about how to organize that, but I think it's a real opportunity the community could explore. You know, I would like to add on to that actually. Um, having two children myself that were virtual learning last year, um, I felt like they were swimming circles around me with their knowledge of how to do virtual learning. <laughs> yeah. And I'm almost wondering if it would even be um, not more beneficial, but another layer of support to give to um, parents and even grandparents. There's a lot of grandparents that are now in the position that they're watching their children mm. home while their parents have to go back to work. Um, and I'm almost wondering if we could do something with, with the adults in the community to help them understand how to access like a Google Meets or a Zoom mm. or how to upload or how to download. So that programming, I think, is a really interesting topic of conversation. Very much so, yes. I yeah. think a lot of those um, things I would love, like Project Rebound did bring out a lot of these needs. And I think there are a lot of partners that are really well uh, situated to kind of take leads on things and others who are more in the support position. I think as we think about the chamber and our, our mission to build a, a prosperous economy here um, and help businesses thrive, that the kinds of things that we can really focus on and shine are uh, framed in that way. And so obviously we want to make sure that our students are performing and that helps parents go back to work and that helps businesses succeed. And so I want to make sure that we're not trying to necessarily get out of our lane, but add the most value where we can. So I think that's something that, um, I, I really uh, appreciate what all you all are uh, referring to. I think it's all really important and it's a matter of trying to pick the right lead for all those things. I think uh, one of the things that will happen from an education point of view is that uh, if we look at where we are now, a lot of schools and university have simply taken the, the uh, pedagogy and moved it to the, to the uh, web or to Zoom or whatever. Uh, I think there'll be an evolution in the learning process 
in, as over the next few years. And that means that all of us who have children are going to have to adapt to uh, how those, those changes occur as, as education becomes more adapted to this way of learning. And so there's going to, we're going to have to have, help each other through uh, this evolutionary process. And, and just, uh, yeah. yeah so see, we're coming up at the close of our hour. Yeah. And so I think if, um, if I'd like to be the first to thank Mike for uh, presenting and giving us a lot <laughs> to think about. If anyone else wants to jump in with a quick thank you, I, I think we've just got a couple of minutes left. I, I, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I have to go to a one o'clock too, but there's three minutes left. I just want to take this opportunity to thank you guys for having me and uh, allowing me to, to talk on and on. I hope it wasn't too boring. And then the other thing that I would like to just recommend, and I know this isn't a business related thing, but um, we've recently released another opportunity, a grant opportunity for nonprofits. So going back to what Grant was saying, yes, the school division is looking toward, you know, helping our community assist with the parenting problem or the guardian problem of how to, how to adjust to this new normal. You know, maybe C4K could mm. apply for some funding um, and sort of shift their uh, opportunity um, to, to training people, not just kids. So computer for kids is one thing, mm -hmm. but how do you get those kids to actively participate in distance <laughs> learning? Yeah. I think they could use our lift grant funding um, to bring on some people who would actually conduct that type of, of training for, for residents who feel uncomfortable with this new normal. Um, so that's what I'll say. I know that was kind of a blurry um, yeah. <laughs> statement, yeah. but check out that new grant. Yeah. It's, a, it's yeah. a great opportunity for nonprofits to uh, help offset some of the losses that they yeah. experienced as well. So Mike, thank you so much. A really yeah. outstanding presentation. And uh, thanks to everybody for being here today as well. And I think we've uh, centered on a very important issue uh, and I just might say, just in working with uh, people through this time, uh, this issue of access as an education and child care uh, are they, uh, some of the most important issues our people are facing. So um, thank you all very much. Elizabeth, do you have other things to uh, help us wrap up? Uh, no, not really. Uh, this group meets the first uh, Tuesday monthly, 12 to 1. Um, we're still sort of mm. forming our, our, our positions, and, and it's a rather new group. Um, but I'm just really, really pleased to, uh, that you all were here today, and we'll keep moving forward. Okay.